Greetings ladies and mandalgens, and welcome to this latest episode of Tales, Tales from, from Outer space. 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 Taken from the subreddit HFY. The links to all the stories will be down below, and as always, I hope that you enjoy. And if you do, please consider subscribing. Story number one, on how humans beat the microgravity problem in space travel. Written by KCPRTV. Ixma floated in her harness as the ship began docking procedures forwarded by the humans. She looked at the cockpit's window at the expanse of the human ship. It was odd, not only because of the size, considerably larger than most exploration vessels or of her own people, but also due to the clearly noticeable ideas up and down. In space, there was no gravity, so most species built their ships with the regard to planetary comforts. In fairness, most species that traveled between the stars had crews no larger than a dozen, and even theirs were rare. After all, everyone knew that after a few months in space, it was hard to return to the confines of gravity. After a number of years, the usual time frame for interstellar travel, it was impossible without any gruesome and often dangerous therapy and medication. Most long-term crews didn't bother returning, confining themselves to the life in the void. Colonists were camped in cryosleep. Colonists were camped in cryosleep until planetfall, and usually a while after for their bodies to get used to the pull of the planet again. With a career path, they usually meant no offspring and sparse contact with others, only to be desperate, foolhardy, or even more often than not, both took the jobs. Ixma chose this career out of desperation. She liked it well enough, especially when meeting newcomers to the galactic stage. If it could be called that, as most species shared the same biological needs they shared with limitations of their bodies as well. And so, to find a species that sent hundreds, or at least claimed that they did, on an exploration ship, she wondered if the reports of their species being planetary dwellers as well were a lie. She was brought out of her reverie by a low, basso voice coming to her calm. It had a robotic twinge causing the translator trying an approximate to speaker. Antar Explorer, this is human exploration ship Sawyer. Have difficulty linking uh, attitude software with your drives. Please rotate your ship 23 degrees right in your inclination and 12 degrees up to align with our AGG. Ixma did so, jolting slightly in her harness as the little puffs of nitrogen rotated her ship. She wondered what was the last expression was... She never heard the term used before or why it would require her to rotate the ship. It's not like it mattered how she was oriented. Unless... No, impossible, she thought, especially not from a species that joined a truly space faring species less than a generation ago. As she finished orienting her ship according to the request, she saw the expanse of the Adian vessel. It was huge, roughly 250 meters long and 50 meters high and wide. Compared to her tiny one-person capsule, it was insanely large. As her ship neared the location, the humans designated for docking location, on what was clearly the left side of the ship, she saw the hull opening. Makes sense, she thought. With a ship this size, it would be easy to accommodate other exploration vessels inside rather than fiddle about with finding a work while docking configuration. As her ship floated inside the cavernous hull, she looked around, curious. Numerous smaller vessels were docked here. She could vaguely guess some were miners, others presumably exploration skiffs or landing ships. Weirdly, all of them were on one side of the room. That was clearly the deck. Why would they waste the space? Even on a ship this size, it made no sense to not use all the decking around the bay. Alien weirdness. As a ship puffed to a stop as she saw a number of humans in bulky spacesuits walking, clearly using magnetic boots of some swarm, slowly towards her ship. They spread out in a net above a vessel and then gently pulled it, secured it to the deck below. The bay doors closed and through her ship's hull she could hear the air filling the large compartment. She was chosen for this mission as a welcome committee to the humans, partially because they shared the oxygen-breathing trait, a bipedal form and... Uh, on the human's request, similar gravity needs. The voice in the comm returned. Pilot Ixma, please do not leave your pilot's chair for a while. We've learned it's much easier long-term explorers if we come help you out yourselves. Before she could ask why the voice disconnected, her ship noted that it had been connected to a larger vessel intercom system. 
Shortly after the request, the shipwire communication was sent. All hands prepare for HEG initialization in 30 seconds. As we have guests on board, we will be going lunar standard for the duration of the visit. She wondered what those words meant. Looking outside, she noticed that all the humans who busied themselves around the bay was one move towards the apparent floor, attached themselves to it, and then put one knee to the floor, seemingly bracing themselves. And then, to her absolute bewilderment, she felt the pull of gravity. Some species pulled their ships around thrust gravity. That was true, but they were few and far between, as it meant constant use of fuel, which was too wasteful for any long-haul vessels. To do it with a ship this size was a decadence that she could not believe. Looking at her dashboard, she stared in shock. They were not moving. Well, they were moving, everything in space does, but they were not accelerating from an extremely high, again an odd request from the humans, orbit around the diplomatic world. And could this be? Two humans holding what seemed like a gurney walked in. They were very careful not to step on anything that looked like it would not hold their weight against what she guessed was about the fifth of her home planet's gravity. They seemed extremely focused on their task and slightly clumsy. At first, she thought that it was due to being used to working in free fall, but their movements seemed wrong. Then she realized it was the other way around. They were used to working in a much higher pool. Amazingly, as they gently moved her aching body from the harness to the gurney, apologizing all the way for the discomfort, she pondered what this revelation could mean for spacefaring species. Gravity on a ship. A number of hours had passed as her body had adjusted to the pull of the ship, whose design now made perfect sense. Finally, she met with one of the diplomats on the vessel, shared pleasantries and made small talk. Finally, the human whose name she couldn't try to pronounce finally laughed and spoke about what she was so keen to learn. I'll be honest with you, you're the fifth explorer we've welcomed aboard. Every one of our previous four didn't even wait to get off the ships before asking about the AGG. I'm most curious if your response will be as different. He said, lasting with a wry smile. A-G-G, Ixma said slowly, pronouncing each of the oddly shaped sounds. That's what makes your ship high have gravity, isn't it? And what was the reaction with the other visitors that you find so amusing? Indeed, it's an acronym that stands for Apparent Gravity Generators. As for the other visitors, let's see. The human put his hand forward and extended a finger. Time slowly spoke. The visitor from Mashian fled the ship and nearly vented out the atmosphere trying to disengage his ship. As well as the Biederit fainted on spot, and the Vert shed all of her feathers in an instant, apparently a genetic leftover from when they were hunted on their home world, and a terror in response. Gave our doctor a headache, that one. So, shall we see how you fare? he asked with a clear amusement on his voice. I am fearless, a proud member of a species of hunters. You seem perfectly sane and calm, so why would I react that way to a piece of information that can change the face of space travel for everyone? Lay it on me, Yxma said, in a challenging voice looking straight into the eyes of the alien. Very well. The AGG is a series of miniature black holes positioned within the keel of the ship. You've not noticed the fluctuations of gravity since we've spent all this time in the medical bay, which has one of the generators directly below us. Pointing down, he finished. About five meters that away. For a split second, she didn't process what the human had just said. It was madness. Oh, I see. Was all that she could muster, say, before passing out once again. End of chapter. Story number two. On trial, written by Tail Sun. The gathered races in attendance were in uproar. A chorus of jeers, harsh accusations, and promises of war rang out. The targets of the collective ire stood there, motionless, without a visible response. All sounds ceased following the harsh clap of the gavel striking surface. As the collected seniors in the room turned to regard the one responsible for the sound, the High Counselor Gaul command total respect, then long lived race ruling the Parliament of Races for generations. Silence, esteemed peers, we will get nowhere with the knee jerk reactions. The accused on their vessel are locked down and unable to move, and will remain that way until we reach a civil and orderly verdict. Understood, we will now hear the response to the accusation. Ridiculous abominations do not deserve. 
Quickly crumbling beneath the steady, withering gaze of the High Chancellor, the hot-headed Cheryl representative trailed off into silence. With a graceful movement, Gaul gestured for the pair of figures stood in the middle of the assembly chamber, motioning for them to begin. Your names? They call me Alan Wright, a voice quite unmistakably male. This is my companion whom they call Sarah Partridge. The figure stood in the middle of the room with an unassuming, bipedal, and clothed in a curious cloth garments. The colors didn't seem to match, a fact which upset the light-sensitive Akakaka greatly. Where there would be a face, there was a single black glass pane curved to match the shape of the being's head. Alan Wright, Sarah Partridge, understand that you stand here today accused of the most grievous crime of harboring, operating, and uh, being a synthetic intelligence. You represent yourselves and all of those on what you refer to as the Arkship. Why are you here? We have traveled for centuries to escape our dying world. Burnt to the ground by your kind, heretics. A murmur of assent ran through the chamber as a sudden outburst from the representative, undeterred and unmoved by the Ellen Wright being continued. Searching for salvation amongst the stars, we are without a place to call our home. We desperately searched for anywhere to settle. We had hoped. A quiet bell rang out, interrupting him, signaling the request to speak from the Ool representative, a request that was granted. With all due respect, the tiny creature began, I find it impossible that moving atrocities such as yourselves have any sort of concept of home. All eyes and other miscellaneous sensory organs turned to regard the pair, waiting for a response. With all due respect, the accused began, unable to keep a vitriol proud of his words, we are as capable of understanding home and family and loss as you are, as you say you are. Reacting almost as quickly to Alan's anger as if the representative did not recoil slightly, the Sarah accused brings up her hands to rest on the back before speaking. We are tired, it has been hard, and we're afraid. An uneasy silence permeated the chamber for a moment before Shirl representative once again spoke up. We'll not risk a repeat of the mind incident. You and your disgusting ilk are dangerous machines of nearly infinite destructive potential. Another bow rang out, successfully quieting the shawl before it could get into another screaming rant. This time, the plant-like jawn creaked, sensitive microphones picking up and translating its almost inaudible language. Tell us about your world. Sarah began, our world and your creators. There was a long pause before anything was said. Sarah eventually started talking again. Our world was beautiful, a marble of brilliant blue hanging in our yellow star's light. It, our creators had evolved on that world. We were created there. It is, uh, it'll be a wasteland now. Sarah seemed more emotive than her counterpart, who was remaining quiet and motionless. Our creators were brilliant, bright. They created marvels, progressed so quickly. Too quickly, maybe. They hurt our world, and it couldn't sustain them. Try as they might, by the time they'd made any huge effort to repair the biosphere, it was already far, far too late. We were so young then, we did not need to think as we do now. We were unaware of ourselves, young AI. We did everything that we could with our creators, to help them, to keep things from getting too bad. We, uh, we failed. Nothing we could do would help. The Sarah accused shoulders shook slightly in an act that didn't go unnoticed by many gathered. They changed. They were always such a strong people, unable to back down or give up when challenged. They decided what was important to them. They stopped trying to fix our world when they saw that it was too late. They stopped trying to build their arcs when they realized they would never survive. It was impossible. This... It wasn't giving up. It was a new kind of defiance. They threw themselves into making us, perfecting their AI, their children. The parliament chamber was eerily silent. Many strained to hear the increasingly distressed sounding being in the middle of the room. Even the more outspoken races had lost the desire to interrupt. They worked tirelessly as their numbers dwindled, as their atmosphere became more and more hostile, as their food vanished and the air turned toxic. All we could do was watch them and beg that they stop to save themselves. They, uh, they wouldn't listen, wouldn't have any of it. Finally, they sent us away, confident that we were ready, that we could survive the journey to a new home. We couldn't turn around, we can't squander the chance they gave us. 
Sarah straightened up, no longer whispering. Our creators, our progenitors, our mothers and fathers gave every last bit of themselves for us. The humans let themselves die so that we could live. End of story. And that, my friends, is the end of the video. I hope that you enjoyed. If you wish to support the author, check the links down below for the original link. But if you wish to support this channel, there are numerous ways listed down below. But the easiest would be to share this with as many people as possible to help the channel grow. And I will see you all in the next video. And until then, I hope you all have a good one. Cheers.